Can you hear me? Oh, no. Okay. So we're really lucky to have Mr. Hassan here today, who is a father of his Yaya, who's in seventh grade. He was in 6S last year, I believe. And Mr. Hassan is here too, to videotape. He is our ancient Egypt expert. And so, although we might not have, depending on where you are and your studies have gotten exactly to that, some of you might just be ancient Egypt experts on your own. And we're really lucky to have him here today. We expect and know that you all, even though you have your materials with you, will give him your undivided attention because we only have this short amount of sacred time with him and then from here we'll go to lunch but you'll wait until the end of the um, presentation and then we'll let you know how that goes. So can everybody give Mr. Hassan a round of applause? Time that we have, and the, the topic is huge as you see that, it seems up. All right, and so I'm going to start right away. And uh, the way I'm going to do it is just going to be uh, questions and answers, and then some slides that I'm going to show you right here. With the slides, we'll make my idea more clear. Also, I do have a diagram here for uh, the Tomb of the King, and I do have something very interesting. I do have uh, a mummy. Not a real mummy, as you see that, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about it and I'll tell you about the mummification process and why the mummy, why the mummies were the target of the two robbers. We wanted to get the tubes and get the mummy because it has or it had uh, all the treasures and all the jewelry and the jewels that the king had. Right? So I'll talk about it in more detail. So just out of the, just letting you know what I have here. What I have here is a diagram of the tomb of Kita. So let's start. Ready? Yeah. Anybody's ready? Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, this is me. My name is Mustafa Hassan. I'm originally from Egypt, and I'm an Egyptologist. Okay. I used to be a tour guide in Egypt. I used to take people who are coming to visit Egypt to the pyramids. The states and the valley of the kings, all the beautiful things that you all heard about in Egypt, right? And uh, right away, we're going to start with the pyramids and the tombs of the kings. Now, the question to all of you first of all, how many of you, how many of you here have been to Egypt before? Can I see a show of hands? Oh, I see good, good numbers. Wow, great. So, how many people have visited the pyramids before? Okay, right? Now, here's the, uh, what we call the Giza pyramid, and here's the, uh, uh, the Great Pyramid, one of the ancient world wonders. Okay? And right next to it is what? What is this? Space, right? Okay? And this is me with one of the uh, groups, some of the groups, and in Giza, Giza pyramid. Just for you to know, we have in Egypt more than 120 pyramids. 120 pyramids. But the most famous ones are the ones in Giza, the ones that you see behind me, behind these ones. So we have about nine pyramids in Giza Plateau. Giza is the name of the area, right? Okay. Now, um, another question to you. The pyramids are what? Are palaces, holes, or tombs for the pharaohs? What? Palaces, can I see show again? Palaces? Palaces, okay. Home, okay. Tombs, all right, guys. I like it. Excellent. So it is a tomb. One pyramid is one tomb for a great man. A great man is the pharaoh, the greatest man in Egypt, the ruler of the country. Okay. However, in Egypt, after after the old kingdom, after the fall of the old kingdom, talk about the year 2000 BC. The two robbers found that the pyramids are too clear, too obvious, for, for them to steal, to rob. They said, you know what, we know they have the treasures inside. We know that we have the mummies inside of the pharaoh. And when you do the 
modification process, they, when they do the wrapping, like this, let me show you. When they do the wrapping with the mummy, you see, the linen wrapping. Everybody see that? Is it clear? Okay? When they do the wrapping, they put it between the wrapping, they put the jewelry, the jewels that the king had, used to wear when he was alive. Right? Not only this, during the modification process, they pull out the organs from the body, and they don't leave the body empty. They replace these organs by what? By precious stones, sending precious stones, and some jewelry as well. Right? So the target of the two robbers, you want to get and break through the pyramids and the tombs for what? To get what? To get to the mummy. Right? Everybody got that part? That's why we wanted to rob the pyramids. Or we robbed, we already robbed the pyramids. And that what made the kings who came later on, like King Tut, one of them, to change the idea of the burial tombs from a pyramid to tombs carved in a place called the Valley of the Kings. Anybody know the Valley of the Kings? Anybody knows where the Valley of the Kings is in Egypt? In what city? Luxor. City of Luxor. Right there, you X O R. This is where the Valley of the Kings is right now. Okay? So the ancient Egyptians, the pharaohs of the 18th dynasty, 18th dynasty, the great dynasty of the New Kingdom, which is the strongest dynasty ever. At that time, talk about the year 1300 BC. 1500, 13 to 1500 BC. At that time, Egypt was the superpower of the world. It was, it was called the Egyptian Empire. It extended all the way to Turkey, from the east, and all the way to Kenya, in Africa, in the south, and all the way to Libya, and close, you know, you know, like past Libya, past Libya, the west. So it was a huge empire at that time, okay? So the kings, they thought of hiding their tombs, so the tomb robbers won't come and find them and then rob the mummy. So two things, the pharaohs and the uh, priests were trying to hide the mummies and trying to hide the tombs. So in the afterlife, in the judgment day, the soul, they called it the ka, K-A, the soul, will be able to recognize the feature of the king, and therefore the king will be resurrected. That means coming back to life in the judgment day and enjoying the paradise. Okay? So this is what happened. The two robbers trying to get the bodies, and the kings and the priests are trying to hide the bodies in the tombs. That's exactly what happened. See? All the way around. This is the choose a mountain that looked like a pyramid. See where I'm pointing? Everybody see that part? Because still the pyramid is sacred to them. The shape of the pyramid. The, you know, it looks like the rays of the sun, rock, or rain, coming down from, from heaven all the way down to earth, forming the connection between heaven and earth. Okay? So they still wanted to find a place where they have the pyramid, but at the same time trying to hide the tombs. And that's exactly what happened. They carved the tombs in the valley of the kings, in the mountains. Let me show you. Here, these are the tombs. Anybody see that? See how they uh, carved them in the, in the mountains? And just two examples here, you see where the arrow, the red arrow, just pointing out to the tomb of King Tutankhamun, right there. Now, this is the tomb of the king that I'm talking about, or that I'm going to talk about today. But if you look above it, this is another tomb. Can you all see it? See what I'm pointing? Can everybody see it? This is the tomb of King Ramses the Sixth, who came later on and built this tomb above the tomb of King Tut. This is not something normal that happens all the time. Normally they say, you know, they keep apart, they keep the tombs apart from each other. But at that time, it was towards the end of the Pharaonic period. And the Valley of the Kings already, you know, full. That, that's why this is what made the king ranks of the six build his tomb right above the tomb of King Tut. Right? So the two robbers later on 
rob this one, and they never expected that there will be another tomb underneath. When they, when they, you know, finished robbing it, said, okay, let's go somewhere else. But not in the same spot. You see what I mean? That's why the tomb of King Tut was saved. And that's why he became the most famous pharaoh. Now, this is a very important question. When people ask you, when you read through, why King Tut was so famous? Because his tomb was the only tomb that was found so far intact. That we found it full. We found all the treasures that I'm going to show you part of it right now. Okay? That's why he was famous. Now, a question I would like to, to hear when, before I go on. Here is the tomb of King Tut. It's called KB5 or KB62. KB stands for King's Valley, number 62. KB62. Alright? This is the number, this is the 62nd tomb that was discovered in the Valley of the Kings. But was the only one that was found intact with all the treasures in there. Okay? Now we keep going. Now, he was discovered in the year 1922, okay, by a British Egyptologist. His name was Carter, Howard Carter, right? And, uh, you know, when they broke through the hole in one of the, in one of the walls, put the flashlight on the other, he said, he asked him, the helpers, his helpers asked him, what do you see, Mr. Carter? He said, oh my God wonderful things because the flashlights i mean the whole reflected the lights to his eyes and he's saying wonderful things it's, it's a word that's still you know alive till today people you know as a geologists we always say when we find a tomb when we look for a tomb we say wonderful things that means there's something here okay now we keep going all right uh now who's he done and why do we call him the boy king Anybody knows? Okay. Uh, all right. What do you think? Why do we call him the boy king? He was like 11. He was 11. Good question. Yes. Uh, same thing. Same thing. You're right. Absolutely. Yes, he had 100%. Say again. Absolutely. He became a king when he was a kid. He was at the age of nine. He was nine years old when he became a king. And he unfortunately died at an early, very early age. He only ruled for 10 years. He died at the age of 19. Okay? That's why we call him the boy king. Even the features, if you look at the features of the king, you can tell this is a kid still. Okay? And the thing is, as soon as the kings ascend to the throne of Egypt, the pharaohs, the first thing they do is to start to build their tombs. Because they believe in the afterlife. They believe that this life that, that they were living is a very short, is going to be a very short life. But the immortal life is the one to come. That's why they took good care of their tombs. That's why they put all their treasures in there. That's why they put a lot of statues in there. A lot of statues in the bunny. In case the money is going to be robbed, then the soul of the king in the afterlife will be able to recognize the feature of the king and give him the right and if you buy the right body, right? Resurrection is really important. It was very important. It was a, a, a core belief in their uh, uh, religion, the ancient Christian religion. That resurrection, you will come back to life and will be, there is a judgment day, there is people that will go to paradise, there are people that are going to be tortured. So uh, you're going to be good in this life so you can go to paradise. This is what they had in mind. This is this is what this is why they built the tombs, you know, for. Okay, uh, this is a uh, King Vikanti. Have anybody has anybody heard about King Vikanti before? Yes, who's King Vikanti? Yes, he died. He died at an early age. Not too early, you know, you're right. But he died uh, as a young man. Uh, and he had his, his son, King Tut, who ruled after him, but he was too young. Too young. So the pharaohs wanted him to, I mean, the priests wanted him to rule 
to fill the place of the king, despite the fact that this king, King Jehaten, changed the religion. This is really important, guys. His father disagrees the priests. Why? Because the ancient religions at that time, before King Jehaten, they were polytheists. Do you know what polytheist is? They had many gods. Okay? Like the god of the sun, the god of the sea, the god of the moon, the god of earth, the god of the sea. Polytheists, all of them, like many, right? And each god had its own temple. Okay? And each temple had its own priests. Okay? So the people used to go there and you know, enjoy the time in the temple, and the priest would tell them, okay, the god of all this and that, you're going to make offerings. When they make the offerings, you know, the priests are rich. You know what I mean? This is, so this king did not like that. This king, Ignatan, did not like this at all. He said, no, there's no such thing called priesthood. If you would like to talk to God, talk to him directly. He can hear you. You don't have to have an intermediate, right? And he said something very important. He called his God Aten. That's why his name is Ignatan. A-T-O-N. Aten. He said, my God is not the sun. No, no, no. It's not the rock. Great rock. Right? He said, my God is the, the creator of the sun. Okay? And he called, he called him Aten. A-T-O-N. Creator of the sun. He said, you cannot see God by naked eyes. Okay? The God is the leader of everything beautiful. And he said, no such thing is called priesthood. Talk to God, just go to the temple. There are no rooms in the temple. And raise up your hand and worship. That's it. So the priest did not like that. Uh, we don't know if it was a conspiracy against the king because he died early, as the gentleman said. And we found a boy king ruling the country. Puppets. You know what I mean? The, the, in the hand of the priests. And they forced them to change his name from Tutankhaten, Tutankhaten, the living image of Aten, to Tutankhamun, the living image of Amun. Amun, or Amun, A M U N, was the king of the gods, of the polytheists. So they forced him to go back to the old religion. Okay? It was a time of the uh, uh, instability in the country at that time. Okay? Uh, guys, here we have a diagram for a tomb. As you see, a uh, very small tomb. And the king did not have the time to prepare a proper tomb. But still, he found a place to be buried in the down of the kings. He's among the kings. He might among the pharaohs. Right? And with it only, before I, before I tell you this, how many days do you think the monkey mission process lasts for? Yes, tell me. Uh, All right, give me, give me an estimate. Close, not too close, but close, yes. Anybody knows? Yes. 85. Close, very close. Yes. 100. In between 85 and 100, okay. Yes, tell me. Um, 90. 90 days, yeah. So it is in 90 days. The multiplication process. Imagine this. They leave the Pharaoh's body in the forest. They leave the mummy in the salts in natural solution so they can absorb and take all the fluid out. And in the year, in the day 40, they start to make the concessions on the sides of the body and pull out the organs. They don't throw the organs away, they put them in something called tenuity jars, okay? To preserve them. And then they replace these organs by jewels, jewelry, precious stones, and ten precious stones. Okay, amulets, name. Okay? So, the king only had, or the priest, or the preparer uh, of the two, he only had 90 days to prepare all of that. I do have here, uh, probably me at the table, a diagram for the two, just from one step. You know, the same thing like here, but I thought of getting you a three-dimensional, uh, you know, the diagram here, so you can see it and you can know exactly how it is. You see that? See the stairs? Anybody see the stairs? 
Let me just show you the one next to it so you can have an idea. Here. This is the entrance of the tomb. Everybody see that? Entrance of the tomb is so small that we had to dismantle the pieces. We had to take the pieces apart and put it through the entrance. So let me just get to where I was before. I just wanted to show you. Yeah. So here's the entrance. And it takes, we took all the treasures, all the things inside, including the money, inside. Uh, uh, the one to the five rooms that we have. Most important rooms, room guys, out of the five rooms is the burial chamber. The burial chamber is number five, room number five. This is where we found the mummy. The thing is, the thing is, in order to fit everything in, we have to uh, put the uh, the rooms. We have to put the shrines inside one another. Let me show you. Look at that. Now, these are the three anthropoid coffins. We call them anthropoid coffins because they take the shape of the man, of the pharaoh. Okay? Anthropoid coffin. How many of these? How many? How many is here? 